pushing for real reforms or reinventing himself. Iraq Shia leader Muqtada al-Sada is pressing the Prime Minister to fight what he calls rampant corruption. But is it only about fighting corruption? And are Sada's actions fueling Shia in fighting in Iraq? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. For the third Friday in a month, angry Iraqis flooded the streets this week, protesting against corruption and demanding reform. When the movement first surfaced last year, it was mostly secular and prompted promises of change from Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi. But that change never came, and the campaign was reborn last month, with the prominent Shia cleric Muqtada al-Sada at its forefront. On Friday, al-Sada called on his supporters to stage an open-ended sit-in outside Iraq's Green Zone. It's a fortified area of the city, home to government buildings and foreign embassies. Sada calls it a bastion of support for corruption. Protesters pushed past security lines, cut barbed wire, and defied a government ban to answer his call. They want a body to replace his cabinet with technocrats, who they say will be more accountable to the people. The reforms must include the politicized Iraqi judiciary, the elections committee, the financial institutions and the Iraqi banks which have become completely inefficient. The question is not to change one or two ministers. The corruption has been burrowed into the institutions of state as a whole. So I appeal to the Prime Minister and Iraqi Parliament to live up to their national responsibilities to put an end to such corruption. Well, Sada's following has grown quickly over the past month but he remains a controversial figure. He first rose to prominence when he launched a Shia rebellion against U.S. troops in 2003, which led to accusations that he was a destabilizing force who stoked sectarian tension. But now Sada leads a grassroots party that's popular with the working class, and he heads a militia called the Peace Brigades, which deployed armed men during protests earlier this month. Sada's rising popularity has put him at odds with other Shia leaders, including Prime Minister Abadi. Time now to bring in our guests. In Erbil, Renard Mansour, fellow at the Iraq Institute for Strategic Studies. And in London, Saad Jawad, professor of political science at the London School of Economics. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Renard Mansour, let's start with you. Is Muqtada al-Sada genuine in his drive to end corruption, or is this part of a bid to increase his political power, or perhaps both? Well, ever since Muqtada al-Sadr came back to Iraq um, in 2011, uh, his message has been very much so anti-corruption and anti those officials who he views as either are supported by foreign uh, actors, be that the U.S., be that Iran, or be that another actor. Um, and so he, his movement, his grassroots movement, which is one of the biggest movements in Iraq, if not the biggest on the ground in Sadr City and in other areas in the south of Iraq, uh, as well as in Baghdad, is very much so a, a grassroots uh, popular movement. His message has always been clear. It's always been to the point, the point being anti-corruption, anti all of the issues of governance that Iraq has been facing but since 2003. Um, and so he has tried to rebrand himself uh, away from that sort of firebrand cleric that he became known as when he was the leader of the Jaysh al-Mahdi during the civil war. And more, I think more and more he's trying to brand himself as an Iraqi nationalist, um, not governed or not ruled by any external power, but the one who gets his support from the ground, from the streets. Well, Sir Jawad, we heard there the phrase Iraqi nationalist. Now, it was notable during these demonstrations that it was Iraqis' flags that were being waved among supporters of Muqtada al-Sad. Do you believe that he is um, genuine in his desire to reform the economic system and the political system within Iraq? Well, I should think your first question is, uh, is the right one. It's both. He wants to reform and he wants to reinstate himself as a leader of the poor people, as he calls himself. His father was like that. His father's popularity was built on, on this reputation. 
And uh, I should think that Mr. Al Sadr lost a lot of his supporters due to many facts. One of them that most of the people he nominated to the government turned out to be uh, to be corrupt and uh, failures. So I think he is now starting to renovate his his his, his coalition, his party, his group, in order to reinstate himself as a major. Uh, a power player in Iraqi politics. Well, Renard Mansour, the point there that he uh, nominated perhaps some incorrect people to Parliament, uh, his parties, his movement's performance within Parliament itself has had no impact at all, has it? No, and the Ahrar Brak has, I mean, you're right, it, it has had issues and many of the leaders that he has nominated has had issues um, uh, trying to really bring about uh, reforms. Um, the, the political system, the political governance in Iraq has been stalled uh, and Muqtada has been successful in so far as he's always been on the outside and he's always positioned himself as the outside and it's always easier to be able to criticize uh, a government when you, you're not in it and you're not uh, following, you know, Know, running the policies so he's distanced himself and let's keep in mind I think it's important that on more than one occasion he's come out and said I don't want to be part of politics he's actually quit politics number of times but then again then he comes back and takes charge of different movements and now he's see he's seeking to take advantage of this protest movement for his own uh, for for his own popularity as well as for his own ambitions um, and this protest movement has not just started now um, this protest movement movement has been going on for several months uh, and, and he seems to, by, by those who have been protesting for a long time, many see him as almost hijacking their, their original movement. Yes, Sajawad, that is an important point. When these protests began, they were largely secular, they were genuinely nationalist. Is there the danger that he is hijacking a process that began long before he got his followers involved? Well, I don't know whether it's hijacking or not, because as we can remember that the protests, uh, the protest that started last year, which was genuinely civil and uh, secular, but uh, over the time it died down and the numbers were decreasing over the uh, last month. So uh, if you see how this number jumped, <coughs> sorry, jumped up to when he, when Mr. Assad called for the demonstrations, you can see that he has more support, more followers uh, going into the street than the civil and the secular protest uh, managed to do. Well, Renard Mansour, it is significant that the Grand Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani initially backed the reform moves by the Prime Minister. However, last month, he basically pulled out saying he is no longer going to get involved in political matters. Now, many interpreted this as a withdrawal of his support for the prime minister and his attempts at reform. Does this have anything to do with the timing of Muqtada al sads decision to uh, create public protest? Well, I think that's an interesting question. I mean, clearly there was a vacuum that emerged, uh, as you say, when Sistani decided to pull out. Sistani's line for a long time has been that he would prefer to stay out of politics. Um, I think what happened at that time when he moved in was the crisis was to some point, to such an extent, a danger that he thought it was time for him to at least get involved to some extent because when he issues a ruling, most of the members of parliament uh, in, in, in the, in the government will have to sort of follow his line and so I think he moved in at that point because he was worried about where uh, the stalemate of governance I think now uh, he, pu he pulled out because he sees that perhaps Abadi is looking to uh, reshuffle re the cabinet and Sistani doesn't really want to be too pose too much of an interference on any sort of government formation or reformation process but nonetheless Muqtada Sadr definitely saw this as a chance I mean he's always sort of distanced himself as much as he can from Naja, from all the other schools, and has <coughs> usually established himself as more of an independent um, Ayatollah. Uh, Asad Jawad, uh, what has uh, prevented the Prime Minister from implementing the reforms? Is it merely a matter of going ahead with reshuffling the government? But is that possible given what has been a fragmented political process in creating that government in the first place? 
Well, the, Mr. Labadi has lost many opportunities to do reforms, and he got uh, support from everywhere. He's, I think he was the first and the only ruler of Iraq who got regional, international, and uh, uh, support and internal support and the support of the Marjaiya of Mr. Sistani. But he failed to exploit all these source of support to his advantage and he kept on hesitating and dithering about the decision he should take and up to now he's not doing anything and I think this is very much weakening his position as for the Mr. Sistani I think uh, the position or the attitude of Mr. Sistani and then Marja'iya now is could I in my opinion is a sort of belated reaction or feeling of, uh, of sorrow to what they have done through years uh, since 2003. They backed the wrong people. They encouraged the uh, religious political parties to come forward and they encouraged the nominated corrupt people to come forward and to rule. And up to when the time came to uh, this, uh, the distance themselves from these people and condemn them in a very clear words they said we are going we are not going to interfere on polit in politics well as we've been saying these protests are all about corruption transparency international ranked iraq as one of the most corrupt countries in the world last year ranking it at the bottom 10 out of 168 countries officials estimate that more than 300 billion dollars have gone missing from government coppers since 2003 Bribery has become common, with Iraqis having to pay bribes to secure jobs, get permits, and avoid traffic tickets. And although Parliament has recommended 500 cases for investigations since 2014, few have made it to court. But in addition to all of this, you've got a, a shriveling economy, Renard Mansour. Uh, since 2014, you've had the rise of the Islamic State within Iraq. Is it possible to refloat for the prime minister, or indeed any political leader, what many would argue is a ship that is already very deep in the water, and how? Yeah, and I think one thing that we haven't mentioned today that is important is that the prime minister has some very strong rivals. And what's even more prob <coughs> sorry, excuse me, problematic about that is that his rivals are within his own camp, within his own party. I'm talking about his predecessor and some of the leaders of, of the uh, Hajj al-Sha'bi. So even though he has had support uh, of, of others, he's also had, he's faced a lot of trouble. And you're right, the, the economic uh, problem has really hurt him, particularly the fall of uh, the oil price. When you create a budget expecting $90 or $80 and constantly uh, every few months have to redo the budget uh, to, to, to incorporate for such a fall in the oil price, you, you feel it. And I think that's one of the problems that he's facing is this inability to pay. And as we get into the summer, I imagine the protest movement will, it will grow even more because if the state is unable to deliver its services, I'm talking perhaps about electricity or other services, if the state is unable to pay salaries um, and, and uh, the protest movement will grow and so Abadi has faced both internal political rivalries as well as an economic situation that's really hampered him from being able to provide basic services to complete what uh, you know the social contract that the leader should have. Uh, Asad Jawad, would you expand on that issue of the internal political rivalries particularly with his predecessor Anuri al-Maliki and the impact that that has on the Prime Minister's failure to govern effectively? Well, it's, <clears throat> it's very clear that Mr. Abadi has proved to be a very weak personality to start with. Second, he was never nominated or never mentioned as a leader of Al-Dawa Party or elected as a leader of the Al-Dawa Party. He was chosen by some uh, groups who were responding to protests, especially the United States protest against the behavior and the policies of Mr. Al-Abadi, of Mr. Al-Maliki, who failed in many issues and who has, uh, 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 who was surrounded by many, uh, many, many corrupt people, some of them members of his family. So I think he is very weak in the sense that 
Mr. Al-Maliki proved to be the protector of the corrupt people who are the vast majority of the coalition in which Mr. Al-Abadi is a member. On the other hand, Mr. Al-Abadi is not uh, immune. He was also accused and he was also named as a person who has received money or took bribes from certain telecommunication companies and what, what have you. So I think they are all in the same boat in the sense of corruption. But Mr. Al-Abadi, who was supposed to take uh, actions against uh, corruption did nothing in this respect. For example, with even with the small uh, or decreased uh, uh, budget of the Iraqi of, of Iraq, he could have done something because uh, most of the salaries are paid for imaginary people who have never been working, and they are names only on papers in the army, in the police force, and even in the civil service. A lot of people have been registered by these newcomers as employees and have been receiving salaries without doing any, anything. And Mr. Abadi himself said that he discovered tens of thousands of these people, but he didn't do anything about them. A lot of countries like Syria, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, and even Egypt could live with a budget of 40 or 30 billion dollars uh, happily, and they could do some programs. But with the Iraqi case, all the, sal all the budget is going to salaries to people who are not serving in the government. Well, Renard Mansour, with all of that in mind, could Maktada al Sarra have a genuine impact on reforming and changing this corrupt political system? I think there are several ways that Muqtada al-Sadr can have an impact on reform. One, just his, uh, his ability to show how much support, uh, a popular support he has, gives him some weight, um, gives his speeches some weight. I think Muqtada al-Sadr, secondly, his line of anti-government um, is an important one. And I think what you're seeing is perhaps him getting closer to some actors, for example, Hakim's Majlis al-A'la, uh, getting closer to the Hakim party. Uh, as well as I think there might be some co co cooperation or collaboration between Sadr and Abadi. And perhaps Sadr um, could show Abadi perhaps other alternatives to his own internal rivals and Abadi might be able to gain legitimacy elsewhere and, and not have to rely or face some of those stronger internal rivals that we've talked about today, but might find legitimacy elsewhere from the street protests and from those who Sadr is uh, mobilizing. Well, Saad Jawad, in order for the opposition movement, the protest movement, to gain real traction, then perhaps Muqtada al sada will have to rise above what many view as a deeply sectarian past and include those moderate forces who we saw protesting last year, include other political movements who are opposed to the current government. Is he the kind of man who could do that? Could his support go beyond his Abada organization and al Arab bloc followers? Well, he's been trying to do that. Uh, he nominated some sort of a council of experts in which he uh, put some people who are not from his uh, own uh, uh, al Sadr uh, group and uh, who are known as secular people. He's trying to come nearer to other factions, but I think the da most dangerous uh, uh, threat to Mr. al-Sadr is not these groups who are living in Baghdad, uh, who are now being uh, named as corrupt uh, uh, coalitions and parties, say, uh, political parties or uh, uh, religious party. I think the danger, the most uh, 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 fatal danger to Mr. al-Sadr is Iran. I think if the Iranians feel that they are unhappy with what al-Sadr is doing, he will be in very much trouble and he could be even uh, removed from the political scene or scenery. I think this is the, 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 the most dangerous threat Mr. al Sadr is facing. As on the ground, he proved to be very popular. He is trying to come nearer to other groups. He is trying to er erase this uh, sectarian. Uh, 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 sectarian image which his party was t tinged with 
in the last few years, although it's very difficult to do that in in few days. But I think he is gaining some support from different uh, non-Shiite groups. And uh, but I don't think that Iran is happy with him, and this is the danger he has to face and to. Uh, to be very much aware of. Well, Renard Mansour, that's a critical point, is it not? Uh, Iran watching all of this happening. What do you think its opinion is? Well, I think it's important just to go back a little bit in time. When Sadr was exiled from Iraq after Maliki's offensive against him in the late 2000s, um, he went to Iran. Now, his time in Iran is a critical period. I think his relationship with Iran really soured as he did not feel like he was treated as who he sh how he should be treated as the leader of one of the biggest Shia uh, groups um, in Iraq. So then he returned to Iraq, and his line since then was very anti-Iran and anti vilayat al-Fiqih, which means means he doesn't want the Iranian revolution or the principles to be uh, exported to Iraq. And since then, his line has been very anti-Iranian, and he's tried to form coalitions uh, of Iraqi nationalists, going even across, uh, as, as he said, going across to other groups that don't necessarily have to even be Shia sectarians, but looking more for Iraqi nationalists. Now, Iran's position, of course, uh, views Sadr now as, as a problematic figure, definitely. I mean, first of all, Sadr is fighting against, or at least rhetorically arguing against, some of Iran's top allies in the region. The senior leaderships of the Hajj al-Sha'bi, uh, Sadr is attacking. So there's also uh, blaming people like Nouri al-Maliki, who still shares strong relations with Iran. So Sadr is viewed as a problematic uh, figure for Iran, um, and, and, a, and a figure that could destabilize the governing coalition and balance that Iran has been able to maintain in Baghdad for the last few years. Well, Saad Jawad, let's just stay with this. Uh, you brought up this absolutely fundamental issue. What is Iran likely to do? You say it is the greatest danger uh, that Muqtad al-Sadr is facing at this particular point. Is Iran going to step in at some stage actively? Well, in my opinion, I'm not in Iraq, so I cannot speak for what's going on. I mean, I don't have inside information. I have some, but not that much. But in my opinion, Iran tried for the first time to uh, make Mr. al-Sadr end or at least prolong his <coughs> ultimatum to Mr. al-Abadi. And this was done through some people like al-Hakim and other people who in the end managed. I think Mr. al-Sadr was planning to have sit-ins uh, around uh, uh, the, the, the green zone or invade the green zone two weeks or three weeks ago. But then he said, no, we will not go inside the green zone. We are going to sit, to have sit-ins after two weeks around this, the green zone. So this is the first time he retreated from his first position. And I think this was due to some uh, Iranian and American influence or pressure. Now I think the Iranians are seeing that the government of Baghdad which are, they are very happy with, and some of the figures in Baghdad, which they are very happy with them, and they regard as their main supporters, uh, they see their positions are shaken and uh, at, at any time, because if you have seen the pictures of yesterday, you've seen the people who have cut the barbed wire and went into nearer into the, the green zone, and the armed forces and the military men who were supposed to to, to guard these areas did nothing and even joined the protesters when they were walking over the bridge to go to the green zone. So I think this presents a very, very big threat to the Iranian influence and the more Mr. al-Sadr's popularity grow up, the more the Iranian will feel that their influence could be threatened in, in the area and I think one cannot uh, discard any scenario, even liquidation or uh, attempts on lives on the, in, in bo on, 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 on each side on both sides I think or the, uh, 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 a drastic decision to remove Mr. Al Abadi through the parliament or by the president of the republic and nominate somebody else only to quieten these protests well a deeply complex situation my thanks to our guests Renard Mansour and Saad Jawad and thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page.
That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mike Hanna, and the whole team here, goodbye for now.